Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ask Us Anything, AQAV and AV9000. I, uh, today's um, presenter is Bill Lawrence, Executive Director of AQAV. I will hand it over to Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that voice and, uh, and organizer for today's event is Irene Sasso, our membership director and doer of all things AQAV, the heart, soul, and brain of the organization. We can't thank her enough for all that she does for us. Welcome everyone to today's presentation. We want to do something a little bit different um, that encompassed a wide range of topics and things and kind of spice things up a little bit. So we're having this ask us anything topic. At any point during the presentation, please feel free to put your question in the chat box on the platform. We'll monitor that. And as we get through the questions that came in already from folks via email and other mediums, we'll start taking those live questions toward the end of the call. We've got a lot of really good information in here um, based on a lot of queries, some of which we get all the time and a few others that we only got once or twice, but they were really good questions. So we want to address them. So without further ado, I'm going to launch into today's topic. So the common question is, what is AQAV? Well, at, at our core as an organization, we're a not-for-profit and 501c3. And we were formed uh, about eight, nine years ago to, to improve quality in the audiovisual and UC business by teaching uh, an ISO-like platform for quality management systems, quality assurance processes, checklisting, and general habits. Uh, and we've got a very simple credo that we really do try to hold to with the highest level of degree, and that is honor, education, and discipline. We serve the entire industry, not just integrators and users or, or manufacturers, but all of those folks. It, there's something in it for everyone, and they all have to participate at some level in order for the system to work at its highest efficiency. How do we go about doing this lofty mission and goal? Well, the first thing we did was define the standards for quality management systems and AV technology. AV 9000, the de facto ISO style format. We then developed training and course materials on these certifications to address AV quality issues. And that was done through a consortium of many, many people from all walks of the industry in consulting, manufacturing, project management, end users, installers. Everybody in the business came in with their pain stories, their troubles, their failures, their confounding issues. And we put those all in a big pile and sorted out the best possible way to ensure that no one experienced such things in the future. Our third leg of the mission is to provide appraisal audits of AV companies who seek to become either compliant or certified. And those are two slightly different things we can cover off. We also train and certify individuals in that CQT, CQD, CQL, QTM, and other designate certifications that we'll also talk about a little bit. The biggest question we get, and sometimes this is a question that people have a lot of varying answers to, is what, what is quality? What does quality mean? And when we started that mission, we went to the greats of quality assurance. To Jaron, who said quality is fitness for use. To Crosby, who said that it means conformance, not elegance. And Crosby further expanded on that, that people think that quality has to be expensive or very luxurious or heavy or shiny. That's not necessarily true. Our founder, Mario Maltese, stated it pretty succinctly in saying that quality, economy of effort, and profits are different pronunciations of the same word especially for those doing integration and integration support in this business. But the capital letter statement is really how AQAV defines quality. It's conformance to the requirements. You know, if you have to go down the road to get some groceries, you can do that in a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes Benz, or you can do it in an old beat up junker that's safe for the road and starts really reliably, but the windows don't roll down and and, uh, and, and things don't always work the way as planned. If you get the groceries home in a safe and predictable manner, that has conformed to the requirements of grocery getting. 
So it's a quality outcome. The key is to define those requirements and to be able to measure and prove that there's conformance to them. That's quality. Now we see a lot of talk about quality control, quality assurance, kind of what those mean. And the accepted definition of these is, is as we see on the screen here, quality control is good, it, but it's kind of the little Q quality. Um, it's the, the, the first step in a, in a good process. Going out, finding out what the customer needs, getting it all together, staging it, commissioning the system, and making sure that it works is great. There's an inspection at the end of that process before it's handed over to the end user. It means it does work. And it, and it happens. That's good. The challenge with this one is if something went wrong or something was missed in the evaluation or the submittal or staging area, it can affect the very end outcome. And you may have to go all the way back to the beginning to correct it, undo things, redesign, reorder, get additional approvals, get change orders for cost or absorb them yourself. S great thing, still quality still good for everybody, but not as efficient and not as effective as it can be overall. Now, improved quality assurance at capital Q is the systematic process, where at each logical step or pause in the process, we check and check list to make sure that everything is done to conforming with the specifications and the best standard practices. This allows minor error corrections, reevaluations, redesigns, reorders, substitutions, change to be managed before it's affected the purchasing and staging and deployment and programming and all of those other phases that come to follow it. It's the tiny adjustments that keep from requiring a huge course correction at the very end of the journey. And this is the most efficient and the most widely accepted and practiced way to really get a quality program implemented. Monitoring, adjusting on the fly. <clears throat> this is the, the highest state that we really can achieve. It allows for individuals to influence quality at every step, not just one quality control person at the end who identifies everything and then pushes it back up in the in the process to those who are responsible for correcting or, or amending it. This is what we espouse at, at uh, the AQAV and, and within AV9000, <coughs> excuse me, um, and it's broken down in such a way within the construct that all of the checklists and all of the various steps align to this. You'll even see the, the abbreviations after each step's name, CR, DR, SR, that identify the tabs in the checklist. 89,000 is our de facto standard for quality in the AV industry. And de facto means the most widely accepted uh, ISO style standard. It provides a framework of metrics for quality management. It's compatible with the larger ISO 9000 system and the internationally recognized and auditable standard for QMS. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later. Section two of AV9000 provides the actionable checklists, the did you, should we, have we recorded and measured all of the proofs that what we said we would do has been done and we conform to those requirements. The breakdowns are very, very logical for folks in the integration uh, business, whether they're delivery or receivers of the service, the start of the project initiation, the design review to ensure everything's been accommodated and accounted for, the engineering review to make sure that it's been made real and can be delivered as design, making sure the site is ready to receive the gear, staging the equipment that can be and is available to be staged to make sure that it functions in a control environment. No DOAs or substitutions needed to be made that can be made very quickly and easily in the shop as opposed to outlying in the field. The commissioning to make sure the system is performing as the, the description says, and the project completion and turnover. 
This is that step-by-step -step quality assurance process inside of the construct of AV9000 that we showed on the previous slide. The best of the best, the smallest adjustments, the fastest response, and the minimally impacting times in the project timeline to really get all of this stuff done. The best way that we can see to deliver it. So we get a question often, well, you know, this sounds, this, this is kind of odd to do all this formality for the AV and UC business. I mean, does anybody else do this? Well, yeah, I wish I could say that I invented all of this. I would be an awfully smart person and, and probably wealthy too. But no, what I did is recognize like all of the others involved with AQAV and all of the others who have adopted AV9000, I've recognized the value in it and understood how it could be applied in my daily working life. The automotive industry has done this for quite a while and their standard version of quality assurances, QC9000. The organization that oversees them is the Automotive Industry Action Group. That would be kind of like the Association for Quality and Audiovisual Technology, us. Aerospace, it's AS9000 and the Aerospace Quality Group. And Telco, which has had for a very long time, their AV9000 is TL9000, and the Quest Quality Org. They also have the TI, the Telecommunications, the Telecommunications Industry Association, which is long-standing contributor to standards and communications methodology and a great model for what we did inside of AV9000. We didn't try to reinvent anything. We built and modeled upon all of the things that these mega organizations globally have done, and we adopted it. This is a big one. I don't think I've ever been in a class where someone hasn't asked, well, you know, isn't AQAV the same as a VIXA? I mean, why, why do we need two different things? Um, and it's not, it really is not. So the if we look at that top ribbon, there, there are several industry associations out there. Avixa, obviously the largest and most incredible one that there is in education, NSCA, and there are others. These organizations teach skills. They teach us how to design. They teach us how to install. They teach us the rudiments of within CTS certification. I'm a huge fan. I've been a past instructor, a committee member, written context, uh, Got my CTS and CTSD back in 1999 and 2002. So that paper is very old and yellowed now. Still very involved in Avixa. They teach skills. We're the quality assurance organization, and we teach you how to verify that those skills that Avixa and NSCA and all the others have taught are actually being implemented on the project. So if you've been through our course or know much about our course, we reference the CTS design and CTS installation certifications as being an excellent prerequisite for our certified quality technician, CTSI pre, and certified quality designer, which we suggest you have CTSD before attending. We will reference the design standards within Avixa because they are amazing. So much work from so many other industry experts put into those for many years now, just like we did with AQAV. So we don't compete with Avixa. We're not trying to tell you how to design or how to install. We complement Avixa. And that means that Avixa tells you the how, and we make sure that you do the do and help you make sure that you achieved the do. So that really is very complimentary. And in our opinion, and in a lot of opinions in, in various uh, fields, even other than AV, you have the doers and the teachers of the doing and the checkers and the checkers of the doing. And those organizations tend to like to be separate. It's really kind of like your your accountant who helps you file your income tax and the IRS who audits it. You, know, you can't have uh, people inside the same organization and have the greatest efficacy and greatest integrity as you can when the organizations complement each other as separate entities. There's a little bit of uh, a little bit of gift in that not being 
absolutely closely married between the organization that teaches do and teaches check uh, in that the checkers have to be autonomous and agnostic of what's going on. And by not anticipating that something happened or understanding that it should happen within the context of the doing, we allow ourselves to be effective auditors and just be impartial observers of did it or did it not happen and is it or is it not compliant? So we work hand in glove with the Avixa structure, the teachings, the philosophy, and the knowledge base, and have massive respect for that organization. We're getting into some of these questions that have come in very recently, and I love this word, automagical. Isn't quality just automagic? You know, it seems spelled wrong, but I think that it's what people really mean when they say automatic. You expect it everywhere, so you get it everywhere, right? And this is not uncommon when we don't know all of the nuts and bolts and threads of the fabric. We just think, well, I don't know. It tends to work out that way, and I'm not sure why it happened, but it happens most of the time, so we're good, right? Well, you know, the odds are sometimes in our favor that there'll be a good outcome. You can guesstimate what you think the speaker count and amplifier power needs to be for a large performance hall. And if you've been doing the business a while, you'll probably get it right 80% of the time. You might even get it right 90. I know a few people that I would bet would get it right 95% of the time. But the 5% you don't are extremely expensive in terms of dollars, time, credibility. So if you can be right every time, if you can check every possible check, and you can do it quickly and effectively as muscle memory habit, that seems like an awful good idea to do. So no, there's no automatic quality. If I, if I figure that one out, or if you figure that one out, let me know, and I'll do the same for you. We do believe at AQAV that everyone wants a quality outcome. Everybody wants it to do what it's supposed and was agreed to be do. It should come out the way we promised it. There shouldn't be any bad surprises. But that can be difficult to achieve in the real world. And, and it's not because of laziness or ineptitude most of the time. There are timeline pressures. We rush and we forget and we prioritize. Distractions in the field, distractions in the home, in our lives. It, it's just a fact. No one is, is flawless or errorless. Sometimes we're working on things that we've not experienced before, and, and we don't have that background of events, wins, and failures to reference from. That's that always dangerous not knowing what you don't know you don't know. That is probably the most perilous place that we can be. <laughs> Sometimes we have to do things in a non-logical order of operations, you know, and, and, but we have to do it that way because of site conditions, because of equipment back order, because of personnel availability, because of changes. You know, we don't always get to do things in the order that would be easiest or make most sense. And when we've got checklisting and a quality assurance system in place, it allows us to go back and look to see if any steps were missed, anything was done impacting or not accounted for. And then there's a wild card of unexpected conditions in the field. You know, we just don't know what we don't know. The conduit that we thought would be 12 feet long from the table to the display on the front wall is 112 feet long because it had to go around a support column underneath the floor. Or any number of horror stories that are told in the dark corners of the many imbibing institutions of Infocom and around the AV industry around the world. Um, there are all kind of pitfalls in our business and anything we can do to map them and avoid them we're well served to do. The list goes on and on and on and on. A quality assurance program, AV9000, it helps us to manage those risks and even more that we haven't begun to talk about here. The, you know, every year this, this standard gets a revision by experienced volunteered individuals in the field who bring real life failures and successes to the table. And we modify it based on equipment change, technology change, analog sunset, digital horizon, all of the things that are ever changing in the industry. 
So how do you know something's okay if it's not accounted for in the AV 9000 checklist? A really, really good question. Uh, the ISO style format demands a couple things. It demands that we're comprehensive in our testing, meaning that we do cover as much as logically we can. But the granularity required to match that checklist to every single variant of design and equipment, system, and site condition is an impossibility to achieve, and it would make it onerous and just no good for anyone. So we balance that point by getting into the areas where details can be further divin based on the specific design. Every scope of work that comes out, and I know everyone in this industry writes a scope of work and reviews it and amends it and agrees to it, right? All of those scopes have individual idiosyncrasies and performance notes that need to be conformed to. So we can't account for that in the standard, but we do draw the reviewer and draw the auditor, draw the individuals into that area to examine it so that they can add that additional color commentary or detail. So yeah, you can build on the framework of AV9000. We're going to get real careful about what we say next because this is where it gets very specific. And sometimes for folks, they feel it's a little tricky. You got a specific process or project that requires more or different checks, like perhaps you're working in a medical institution and you need to have a HEPA tent, negative pressure tent, and some type of sterilization verification procedure that isn't required on, say, for instance, uh, the speakers over the gas pump down at the Bucky's, then you can make that part of your checklist in your QA. It really should be in there because that is an incredibly critical part of that particular project. You can add those requirements at the end of any respective checklist. At the end of the audio configuration, if you've got a DSP or a mixer, maybe you have a little smiley face mixer that says, checked by me. And you put that little smiley face sticker on there every single time. Add that on after the last thing in the audio commissioning or audio um, mock-up checklist. You can add a whole tab in the workbook after the standard tabs to help address any other specifics. <clears throat> Things like site cleanup or someone that needs to be contacted at the end of every day before entering and exiting. You can ask us how to address things maybe that you don't know how to test and verify or check out ISO and ASQ guidelines to formulate those basic additions. The key thing here is you need to state it in that scope or narrative. You need to have a, a target goal and a way of absolutely verifying and recording the target goal. And there's a lot of ways to get there. In order to conform to certification renewal, that's individuals renewing their three-year CQT or CQD, or your company compliance certifications, if you are compliant or certified, the things you do not do are as follows. You don't remove, edit, or insert content within the framework. And this means if you've got an audio step that you wanna do, you don't jump in there and modify the language around another one that's kinda like it. Or if you just don't think it's important to set gain staging and verify the output level in the room, don't delete that from the framework. Maybe hide the field temporarily, or maybe annotate it in the extra columns to the right, but don't take it in, out, modify it. This is a standard, and if you wish to be certified for a standard, it has to remain standard. Don't reformat or delete parts of the checklist or framework. You can make your own additions or enhancements, but retain the original framework of the checklist in its original entirety. If you intend to submit it for your personal review or for compliance audits as a company. So I like to say this, you can append things to it, meaning attach or affix or add a supplement, but don't amend the content. Don't go in and hack at it and change it. And this is something that's incredibly important. We want you to make it yours and enhance it, but for purpose of compliance and recertification, it has to remain intact in the format that it was issued in. You know, the, the analogy I make here is at the end of the year, 
you know, you can fill out the 1040 form and send it into your tax authority. You could also just go into Microsoft Word and write down what you made, what you think you ought to pay, what district you think it ought to go to and, and send that in. I think that the better result is going to happen if you use the standard form. The IRS will not allow you to just modify or arbitrarily change things within their form. That's a standards organization as well. And ISO is very standard. Good question here as well. Why do you need a CQT certification stamp with a certificate on the wall and the and the and a hand raised? I solemnly agree to the. It, it seems all you really need to do is take some measurements and write down what happens. Well, hey, you know if you're not CQT, you don't want to be. Still take measurements and write it down. I personally, and I don't think anybody would disagree. That's still a good thing to do. But why go through the process? Well. You, again, not to make an analogy that seems too absurd, you can go get the keys to the car and drive it without your license. You probably got to navigate the road and get from point A to point B, but should something go very wrong or should someone stop and question your ability to do that within the legal uh, system of your jurisdiction, you will not be compliant. Certification is the path to fully knowing and understanding the system in the AV9000 framework. It, it establishes your credibility with potential partners, whether that's a manufacturer, if you're an end user, if you want to verify that you're able to receive the information and audit and understand it. If you're an integrator, it shows the end users and potential buyers that you are indeed, you have passed the course, you have passed the certification, you have demonstrated your skills. And it also keeps you in the loop during your active uh, active certification period and renewal every three years that you're up to date on the latest revisions of AV9000. That's updated annually. We're just about to fire up that committee again. It's a volunteer committee. That's kind of how I got started all those years ago in AQAV. We bring in different people, some of the same. We talk about what the current standard is, and we make changes. Now, sometimes there are significant changes made. I know that when I started out as a CQT, and even back before that, when I started out in Avixa and the CTSI, who does rev revisions in the same manner, there was technology that is just gone now. You know, one of my first hands-on practical tests with AQAV was ensuring that we had the proper voltage peak-to-peak -peak on an oscilloscope for composite video. Um, that's just not a thing anymore. One of the things we checked in the checklist was that three-gun projectors, the old tube-style projectors, were converged properly. And those aren't a thing anymore either. So the technology changes. One of the real hot topics and things that is always a very, very animated conversation in the revision committee is all of the changes in our industry over the last year, five years, 10 years, where AV and the network are converged. Security, standard passwords, approach to uh, integrating into customer network verification that those actions are occurring. And uh, a lot of good information comes every year. Once you're certified, you're welcome to join that committee as well and, and, and add your viewpoint and you'll get credit in the standard. If you have the standard or if you want a copy to download, you'll see the names of every revision committee and you'll see that some come, some go, some are now retired. And we try to get a very good, diverse mixture of people, both in terms of what they do professionally, what their personalities are, what their level of experiences are, fresh, new people in the industry, grizzled, old curmudgeons that have been around a long time, and everything in between. And we do have a very diverse organization at AQAB. My wife calls me the analogy man. I don't know what she means by that, but, but I'm going to just make this comparison. You can dress up like an eagle, but does that make you able to fly? I don't have a lot of confidence that that bird's getting off the ground over there. So if you want to, if you really want to walk the walk, you need to learn to talk the talk and you need to have verification to ensure that you took all of those steps. You comprehend and comply with these important attributes. So what happens if you're in all of this audit checklisting 
you know, business and so, something doesn't meet the requirements. What do you do? Do you just stop? Do you lock the door? Do you give up and go home? No, you document it and report it. As an auditor, a CQT auditor or a CQD design auditor, or if you're just using those skills on yourself, allow me to audit myself. You're going to report it. You're going to report it to yourself. If it's just you, make a note, go back, fix it, figure it out, learn from it. You may share those results with the entire team you work with. Maybe the contractor that you're auditing as an independent auditor, think again, that, that unpleasantness of IRS. Um, you're the client, they're the auditor. They're gonna tell you what you're missing or did wrong and you're gonna fix it. You may tell it to the client if you're working directly for them. It, it depends on how the standard's being applied. We see a lot of different things. You know, organizations I've worked with in my day job, not my volunteer role with AQAP, but as an actual day job, we applied it in all of these manners. We would check our peers, audit each other to make sure that we were we didn't miss anything, nothing went wrong. We would audit the installation and we'd bring that information back to the PM and the engineer team and we'd have a after action review. Some people call it a post-mortem. I don't like to talk about things dying. I like to talk about things living and growing. So it's an after action review for the next time. And we'd learn from it and we'd improve from it and we'd put an even sharper edge on our knife. These are all good things. There's no shame in being audited. There's no shame in finding mistakes or finding error or finding what we like to really call it non-compliance. It's a learning opportunity and a chance to not fail. That checklist is a way to get there. And as we've talked about, there's nearly a decade of formal experience through AQAV and hundreds of years of personal experience that have contributed to these checklists. So you say, I really like this AQAV thing. I mean, I think it makes sense to me because as an engineer slash technician slash seller slash project manager, I got that one time where it really went south and I probably could have avoided it if we'd asked somebody and they thought I was doing it and I thought they were doing it and whatever the reason, right? Stuff happened. I love this AQAV thing, but how do I get my manager to get behind it and to really, really get it off the ground and get it moving, you know, make it happen? Well, please let me indulge uh, indulge me while I tell you a story about a young engineer that, that happened a long time ago at an Infocom. And this is a 100% true story witnessed and verified by other people on the call here, as a matter of fact. I think it's going back probably now 20 years. Um, there was a presentation on quality at the Infocom show. And this, this young engineer was there and he was frustrated with the work, frustrated with some failures, had a lot of success, had some things that, that were haunting, um, felt the organization could do better to make things better, but didn't really know how to communicate that and wasn't hearing it. And sitting through the quality presentation, which had a lot of content very much like this, I'll just say wink, wink, nod, nod, before AQAV was a name, um, was excited about this and was all fired up and was like, we're going to do this. This is going to happen and took copious notes. But then toward the end thought, I don't know, you know, we're always in a hurry. We're always trying to cut money. People want it done faster. And AV is the last business in after all the other trades. And if we got a month on the timeline, we probably got a week in the field. And it's just, how does this make, how do we make this happen? And uh, one of the two gentlemen presenting said, well, that's a really good question. And, you know, I think that if you're thinking this is a good thing and you, you feel like it's worthy of implementing it and you talk to management and, and you bring your passion and you outline things to them and explain it to them, they're probably going to want to do it because it makes sense and it works. But I also think that if for some reason they don't, you probably won't be at that organization much longer. And the, the person sat down and, and pondered that for quite a while. Now, I know that this story is verbatim and accurate because the young engineer was me. And the, the one of the two gentlemen that was talking and that, that relayed that to me in front of a crowd of probably 80 plus people was Mario Maltese, our founder and, uh, and a very wise 
person. With him in tow was his son, another member of the board and an incredibly smart individual in this business, James Maltese. Uh, Irene might have been remote at that time, but that was when they were a small AV firm doing great quality work, applying all of these same standards within an ISO construct, but not formally as a not-for-profit. And it would be another 10 or 12 years until AQAV blossomed into its own organization and, and was founded and has grown to the, to the org it is today. And I did take all of that information back to my management team. And they didn't seem real interested in it. And I wasn't with the organization very long. But I do know that when I moved to the next organization, there was engagement in quality. And it made me better at what I did. And it made me less afraid and ashamed when failures happen. It made me want to grow my universe into a wider place. And management saw that effect. They saw how good it could be for the company. And it was implemented to a large degree. And I've been very fortunate to work for companies or implement these systems at companies on a global basis and to be able to attest that they were. I have been audited by the ISO auditors um, at a large telephony and networking global organization. And I passed that audit on the first solicitation, meaning no remedied issues, no required fixes. Now that's not because I'm a super smart dude or, or was better than anybody else. It's just because I followed the recipe that I learned from a lot of people who had been there and learned that before me and were willing to share it with others. And I applied it and I had colleagues who applied it. I had management who supported it. And that made it all survivable and actually kind of entertaining because I knew what to expect. And while other departments were really frightened and had a lot of trouble getting through, we embraced it and enjoyed the audit and we're very, very proud of the outcome. So that's the questions we've received to date. I'm looking over in the chat, chat and we'll get to those in a moment, but now's your chance to ask AQAV anything. Let me go to the chat. One of the things I see from Dean Ellis is when are we gonna hold classes on the calendar? The classes will be updated. Um, they do roll a few times a year. Uh, we've got another CQD class this year and we're gonna have the 2023 dates out hopefully by the end of August, September at the latest. We got stuff going. AQAV is a is a, an organization that was equally affected by a COVID and the shutdowns as everyone else in the integration and the rest of the world was. In person classes uh, ground to a halt. We had to go and build an online training program, an online training portal, and construct for that. We've got that up and running. So we're manning several classes a year, and we're trying and starting and growing to scale the demand that we often see. It's a largely volunteer organization. We've only got one paid employee. We've got a lot of folks who commit a lot of time to do this out of passion for the industry, the outcome, and for sharing their mentorship with other people in the industry. It's very much like the early iterations of Avixa. If you remember the progression of Avixa, it was, it's Avixa now, it used to be Infocom, before that it was ICIA. And ICIA back in the 90s was just like AQAV, a largely volunteer organization. And Avixa still is. They bring in the best of the best, that incredible knowledge base of people on a rotating form to keep it fresh, keep it real, and to, to ask them for their time and volunteerism. And we're very much the same way. You can always reach out to Irene through the aqav.org website. There's addresses on there. The website's under construction constantly. We just re-upped it and changed some graphics. We're going through and ironing some spelling and some formatting out every day because that's what quality is. You don't just do it once, you keep doing it. Um, and there's an awful lot of resource information on there. We're trying to do these webinars at minimum once a quarter, but we're probably gonna take smaller bite-sized pieces and, uh, and make them available more often. There's a lot of benefits to membership, more than we can get into right now. Um, but there's there's all kind of things out there, including calculators, white papers. We're writing blog articles. We ask for volunteers within the organization to do that as well. 
you can go there and see our, our board of directors, some of our volunteer instructors. You can learn about them and what they bring to the table, a few of which are on the call today. So, so any other questions, pop them in the chat. I'm watching that now. We'll, we'll be happy to take them on. Not seeing anything. We got a few minutes left, so I'm just going to go ahead and do some backup slides here. If something comes up, we'll take that question direct. We get it. We get the question of what do these CQ, XO, LMNOPs mean, right? And these are real people in the picture where they're not paid models. I know they're awfully good looking and, they, and their pose is very earnest, but these are actual classes. You know, you touch things and do things in classes and, and you learn things and that's, that's what we do. Well, CQT is that certified quality technician. If you're a CTSI installation from Avixa, this is a great class to come and it's, it's a, well, you get our use for doing it, and, and that's a good thing. Um, this shows that you possess the knowledge to go out into the field or into the shop and physically assess the system, to audit the system and make sure it is compliant to the, to the definition of what it must do. That's that evidentiary validation of the designers. CQT was our first certification in course and still one of the most popular ones. It's uh, it, it's very achievable. It's it's not easy, but it's earnest, and there's a lot of good toothy information in here. And if you've got that CTSI background, you're going to have been exposed to a lot of the things that we're verifying you do in this course. CQD, Certified Quality Designer. That is the earlier stage in the quality assurance process. That means that you know how to review and audit a design, make sure that it's going to be able to be executed in the environment, make sure that everything aligns to the narrative and the bill of materials, and then when it gets delivered in the field properly, that the CQT can verify that it indeed was. There's a CQL, the competent quality leader. And this is really for those management folks and companies. Sometimes in our in, in the industries, the people who are in that C level suite or even the VP and, and director levels aren't immersed in the daily to do of their business. They may be accountant based or, or organizational based or ITIL, but they may not understand intimately the AV and UC business. This is a course that was developed specifically to address that question of what if I can't get leadership to come along. It goes through and analyzes and applies basic quality management principles to their enterprise in a theoretical fashion so that they can see the direct increases in efficiency, the decrease in cost, increase in profitability, the satisfied customers, which is return revenue and return joy, that continual improvement and quality assurance can remit you. We just started in 2022, and uh, this will be a self-serve course pretty soon. Our esteemed board member, James Maltese, is going to record this for consumption at your leisure. The Certified Quality Assurance Manager. This means that they can check the readiness of the AV asset. It's, it's going to recognize when something's wrong or non-conforming. This is the it's kind of a CQT light. You don't have to pull out the, the, the dedicated test equipment and apply the metrics and all of the things. This is more of an, a see, look, touch, feel, I wouldn't advise tasting, a method of going about with some rudimentary measurement gear to make sure the system's ready for use. If it's not ready for use, that's a really good time to call in an integrator or CQT prefer to do a full assessment and determine where the deficit is. This can be at any level. We've, we've got basic people entering the AV business. We've done so, a lot of this for branches of the military specific. They find this very helpful. Um, and it's, it's a good program. One of the lighter things that we do. And, uh, and it's it's the consumption rate we expect to be very high because it's not as heavy a time commitment. So as a commercial benefit, if you're an AV buyer, you know you get that for free. If not, as a as an integrator or par or equipment partner, you can buy in. You get a copy of that AV nine thousand standard with all of the history and the revisions and the construct and the explanations plus the checklist. You get updates on it, trends, knowledge shares. You get a 
a copy of the workbook that's got the checklists in it, including some math calcs and all kind of fun. You get those white paper, the cost of poor quality calculators that we do. We did uh, five myths about quality back on April Fool's Day this year. We had a lot of fun with that. Access to member-only videos as they come available as well. People say, well, you know, how do I how do I explain them to the buyers or the my customer, or my end users, or my my boss that this is this is successful? Well, these are direct quotes from people who are providing service and install. Up to a 95% decrease in warranty hours for this one company. And that sounds like an astronomical number, but if you're if you're in delivery, it's not because you know. So many companies rush off the site because they've run out of time and the next project starting and they just make finishing the project warranty work. I know that's a, that's a super secret, right? That everybody knows. It's also very bad practice. Commissioning can stop that and warranty hours can be retained for warranty work. Getting 30% more capacity without hiring 30% more heads. Now that's not having them work an extra X number of hours above 60 a week. That's just saying you're not doing things once, twice, three times, waiting while Lenny gets Carol to fix uh, Janet's bad soldering. You know, you're doing things in the right order, checking them at the right time, and it's just moving through. That customer satisfaction net promoter face goes to a smile from that uh, ambivalent to angry red face we see there. The cost in labor drop, the cost in rework drop, the cost in change orders that are eaten internally drop. Probably, you know, you make more money so you can be more competitive in bidding and that's good for the providers, it's good for the end users because they're paying less and they're getting everything they want the first time. The providers that perform well, they embrace AB 9000, right? The poorly performing providers will complain it's too hard, it's too much, it takes too long, it costs too much. And I honestly, in my heart of hearts, believe it's because they just don't get it. You know, they haven't had that light bulb moment. I always tell people there's a logical order of operations for anything that you do, right? I mean, I can go straight down my sidewalk to the mailbox, get the mail and come right back in the front door. I can go out the back door, dig a tunnel under the neighbor's fence, shimmy up the tree, climb across their roof, drop off the front like Spider-Man, be taken to the hospital in an ambulance after six months of rehabilitation, come back and get my mail. That's probably not the best process. The shortest distance to a sure outcome with minimal effort is a good process. That's out the front door, straight to the walk, to the mailbox and back. When you see that, you start to wonder why anyone would do it any other way. So I see some comments in here. I'm going to go back and read. Christy says, if I can do a CQT, anyone can. I think the level of hilarity in that is very high, but I do see what she means. Christy is an extremely talented and diversely talented person experienced in integration and in stage rigging in logistics. She's an incredibly well-rounded individual, and we're very proud to have her on our board of directors as such. Um, she brings a diverse technical knowledge and a mindset that has added so much value. Thank you, Christy. We knew you could do it. Uh, Kelly asked if we can share the presentation. And absolutely, uh, we'll be happy to share the presentation. We'll send it out in an email. We're also going to, we've been recording this, as you saw at the beginning of the call. So that'll be available to view on the uh, video channel, which you can find through the aforementioned website. So we got a few minutes left. I'm happy to wrap it up here. Or if anybody else has got any comments, concerns, clarifications they'd like to hear, ask us anything. All right. I'm going to take that silence as an acknowledgement that I have indeed covered every possible question for the group at hand, at least those they were willing to ask at this point in time. The conversation does not stop here. You can reach us uh, through the website. You can reach Irene over there. She can get to me. You can ask anything you like at any time, and we'll get back to you in a timely manner. We love to talk quality. And again, this is a volunteer organization. 
You know, one of the things my wife of nearly 40 years always snickers about is that I always seem to take a few vacation days from work to teach courses. And she does it in good nature because she knows how much I love to do it and how much I love being in, involved with this organization. And people like Jim and Irene and Kelly and Christy and all of the others who volunteer along with me. The best thing I have done for myself in my career is to be involved and to sit in the room and now in the calls with people who are so much smarter and more experienced than me. It's a gift I really advise that you give yourself as well. And a great way to start that is engaging with AQAV. So much of this knowledge and wisdom is written down. Active participation in the group and classes and you can ask those questions and share your own because you will bring new and valuable things to the organization, whether you've been in this business a year or 38 or 40 like me, or even more than that for some of the folks that we know. Thank you so much for taking time out today to come learn about AQAV. Wish you the absolute best in the remainder of summer, and we hope to hear or see from you in the future. Be well. <laughs>